Okay, looks like I'm going. Hey, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to Astro, our Astro Coffee Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I run DeepAstronomy.com, and we do this every Thursday, 3 o'clock. Take some time out. We do a stream on YouTube, and we talk about a variety of things. Sometimes I have guests. Sometimes I don't. Today, I don't. But today, I want to talk about the topic of the world's observatories and the effect of the on and the, and the effect on the professional observatory realm on the professional astronomy realm on the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic that we're currently being um, uh, we're taking action against to try and stop it from spreading. So, a lot of my former colleagues and I have been talking about uh, what's going on and and um, you know what their various institutions are doing, and so I thought I'd share some of that feedback with you because it's um it, it, you know it's going to have an impact like almost every aspect of our lives now you know the uh, the coronavirus is probably going is going to affect how professional astronomy is done and so I thought we'd talk a little bit about those effects today but before I do I want to welcome everybody I see my I see a lot of regular people Adam's back Peter is here Nils, you're here. It's good to see you, Uncle Bill. Wow, this is this is early for you, Uncle Bill. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it um, for um, for taking time out to watch the stream, and also for you, Andy. Hi. Also for you, uh, uh, Uncle Bill has taught me a little bit about my streaming requirements and my bit rates and stuff like that. So I'm streaming only what I need to stream, so that those without a lot of bandwidth can still see the stream. Okay. Uh, this is more of an issue, I think, on other platforms than this one, but. I'm streaming at 720p today because I don't need to do any super high def stuff. And I also want to take just a quick minute, get a little bit negative at first because this is YouTube and then I'm going to get to the positive stuff. If you are here and you're watching the VOD, that's the fact, that's the video on demand part. That's this hangout that you caught after it had, after the event happened. Don't leave me comments about how you want me to just get to the content. Okay. Scroll in about 10 minutes in, you'll get to the content here uh, because right now this is a live stream. And one of the things, one of the reasons I do live streams is I like to interact with people and you're not here right now. You're watching it later. So that's on you. And that's not my problem. Okay. Now I feel like I have to say this because YouTube commenters and especially I guess their time is just super precious because they can't be wasted with any time. They got to get right to the content and they will leave really crappy and mean comments if they don't get to it. So YouTube VOD viewers, if you're here after the event's over, click in about 10 minutes. It's not rocket science. You just hit the little fast forward button and you're in further along to the content because God knows your time is precious. I'm sorry, but I'm on a bit of a thing about YouTube right now. I'm only here once a week uh, doing this hangout because of my audience that, uh, you know, I want to interact with you guys on YouTube. And that is where my audience is the largest. And so I'm here every week uh, out of respect for that. But other than that, I've just really had it with YouTube. So um, if you want to catch brand new content, I've got a library.tv channel. Um, I should put the link in the description. I did not do that today, but I will. Um, I'm, and that is a um, that is a Bitcoin blockchain based platform where I can upload my content and not have to worry about the nonsense that YouTube puts me through. So a uh, little bit of negativity there at the top, only because I have to deal with this negativity every single time I do a live stream on YouTube. The apparently YouTube commenters, their time is just of the utmost paramount importance, and do not want it to be late wasted uh, unnecessarily. So. Go 10 minutes in and I'll be done. Thanks for that, for, for dealing with it. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so um, anyway, welcome, guys. It's good to see you all here. Um, this is a... Oh, hi, Susan. Yeah, you're from Florida, too. We both are. I don't know how you feel about uh, our... Well, never mind. I want to get into that. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, we are... Uh, it's having... We had some really hot weather here recently in Central Florida and, and we had some rain finally. Uh, coming through because we're thinking in top of everything else. I think we're on a drought a bit of a drought. So anyway uh, Hey yeah. <laughs> Thank you Susan man. You you're you really are a rock star and this is a good way to help I was, That's another thing I want to bring up. I have gotten some amazing uh, Feedback from all, all of you got from many of you guys my audience on YouTube 
uh, in response to my shutting down the Patreon campaign uh, earlier this or this month. Actually, I'm setting it down permanently, but but um, it, it's right now it's it's it stopped temporarily, and then I'm going to permanently turn it off in about two weeks um, because uh, you guys, you know, you guys, the feedback you guys have given me really warmed my heart. So on the one hand, I just talk to those YouTube commenters that just show up and and want to be. Uh, negative uh on the flip side of that there's a lot of really great people here on youtube uh, among them susan hunter and all the other people who support me regularly so those comments were not directed at you because um uh, you're here live and you're watching me live and we're interacting and you watch and you're giving me great feedback. So on, on the positive side, I want to thank you for that as well. And while I am not making YouTube my primary platform anymore, I hope you will still hang around when I do upload things, uh, for, um, for you guys, because, uh, you have been such a great support. We'll always do these Thursday hangouts too. So don't worry about that. Um, yeah, George, it's true. It really is, man. And it's gotten to the point where I just don't care anymore. Um, the, the, the amount of you, 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 you'd think, you know, you ask yourself, how can a guy with a quarter million subscribers on YouTube, uh, not be making any money? And, uh, I could go into a whole, uh, episode on that and I won't right now, but suffice it to say that the top 10 videos that I post on my channel, uh, all of which do tens of millions of views. Of those top 10, only one earns me any money, and that's the Hubble Deep Field in 3D uh, video. And that's because by luck, by sheer luck, YouTube's content um, ID algorithm has not flagged it for anything whatsoever. And that's the only video that I have in my top 10 that are, is actually earning money. The rest are somebody else is earning money on it uh, because they've claimed ownership of content that I make very darn sure uh, I'm allowed to use. But even so, I get dinged on it. So there's no money to be made in YouTube if you've got 250,000 subscribers and make the kind of videos I make. So just anybody out there doing it, just know that. Um, it's just not worth it, really. And the only the only thing that makes it worth it are you guys personally and the feedback that I get from you in the comments. And a, to get to that wonderful feedback, I've got to go through some pretty crappy stuff too. So there's always, YouTube has become, there's always been a balance. And now that balance is starting to tip in favor of getting the hell off of here. So thank you, Susan. I do appreciate your help. And don't worry about it off stage, man. Dude, that's not why I'm here. Okay. Let me, I, I'm talking about stuff that's true and that happens on YouTube because I get asked these questions a lot. But this isn't a this isn't me asking for anything. I just want you to know, you know, what's going on here uh, with YouTube and why YouTube is such a problem, and why I'm just sick of dealing with it. That's the only reason I'm I'm talking about this stuff. I'm not expecting anybody to do anything about that. You, you guys, um, you guys are here because you want to be, and I want to be here because I want to be. <laughs> so it's all good. All right, it's all good, man. Another really good show I've been watching. Okay, so the world's observatories are being affected by this coronavirus business. And in what way is it being affected, you may ask yourself. Um, so let's get into it. Let's just, let me just uh, pull up my little, my little desktop here. And um, the first thing I want to talk about, I, this, this happened on a couple days ago on March 30th. Um, Mauna Kea, as you may know, there are a great many telescopes on the top of the mountain of Mauna Kea in um, uh, Hawaii. It's one of the premier locations for putting observatories on the planet. And the reason for that is that it sits at 14,000 feet and it is the, the peak is well above all of the cloud cover. Now, this is Hawaii we're talking about. It's a tropical island gets lots of rain, lots of moisture, a lot of water vapor, but all of that stays below 14,000 feet. In fact, at these observatories where you see this picture is right now, look how dry it is there. There's no vegetation in part because it's so high, but also in part because it's dry. There's not a lot of water up there. Most of the clouds stop at about 11,000 feet and all the rain and the, and the weather happens below there. Above that, 11,000 footish level is a bunch of dry, clear air. I think it gets cloudy just a couple of weeks throughout the year, right? Uh, total. So it's a really good place to put an observatory. But as many of you have heard me say many times, the future of astronomy is in the infrared 
And the reason for that is that, that we want to look at distant galaxies in the distant universe. And the mo those, those distant galaxies are at high redshifts, and they've been redshifted into the infrared. So if you want to see them, you need to look at infrared wavelengths. Well, the problem there is that water vapor blocks a lot of the infrared wavelengths out at about one micron and farther. So these dry, these dry observatories, these dry locations are why you see so many observatories being built there because water vapor is low. The same is true for the uh, Andes Mountains uh, in Chile and off the uh, west coast of South America. You see a lot of observatories being built high in those mountains for the same reason. So they have shut down telescope operations on all of the observatories up there uh, on, on the mountaintop. And they've done it in response to the governor's stay-at-home order uh, to prevent you know, the spread of the coronavirus. So, you know, it's all very, um, it's all very understandable. Uh, and it's going to affect 500 technicians, astronomers, instrument scientists, engineers, and support staff who work at the Big Island Summit and the observatory bases that are below it. Um, and uh, that much of these observatories uh, is also has a, uh, the University of Hawaii has a hand in a lot of these operations and they're affected by it. They're on Hilo and Kona, I think, as well. And so, um, but in, this article points out, this, by the way, came from Hawaii News Now that I'm looking at. But um, it, it says here that um, a lot of the work at Mauna Kea is federally funded. So... Few, if any, of the employees are likely to be laid off or furloughed, um, but they are still, what it's really going to affect is the science that's being done at these um, observatories. And in particular, this is something I found a little bit saddening, but you guys remember last year, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope took this image of a the first ever directly imaged black hole this of an event horizon of a black hole this wasn't an inferred uh, uh, image of gas coming out that's being sucked into a black hole this was the actual event horizon itself and it was that blobby sort of out of focus ring we all saw and many people were like eh you know what's the big deal but if you understood what that image was of and what it represented it was actually a pretty uh, herculean achievement well they're starting I think yesterday they were going to start the second campaign on that uh, Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, among And among those participants were many people at Mauna Kea. Now, the Event Horizon Telescope isn't just one thing. It is a, it is a conglomeration of all, well, not all, but of many observatories around the world that are connected via long baseline interferometry, VLBI, or VBLI, for long, long baseline, very long baseline interferometry. Parometry, VLBI, okay, and and it, it connects the telescopes in such a manner that the individual signals, like the individual uh, observatories around the world, act like a a pixel almost in a much larger and uh, a much larger detector that is about the size of the diameter of the planet Earth. It's not that's not a great analogy, but it's close enough, right? I mean, then it, it, it all of these telescopes from around the world combine their signals at the same time during an observation and they do some time corrections and things like that because of their distance on a sphere but they uh, connect their signals in such a way that they that they use the distance between them as a resolution element and so they they end up with a telescope that is effectively the size of the earth in diameter uh, to point at things and they pointed i believe it was m87 and took that image of the um of the black hole that we saw, the supermassive black hole that was there. And they were going to build on that data because that data was the culmination of many, many months of data taken over several locations around the globe. And so they wanted to pick that up. That's not happening anymore. So that's been delayed and, uh, and may not even be picked up. The, the reason, the thing about the, the event horizon telescope that we need to realize is that they involve most, if not all, of the most subscribed telescopes on the planet. And so, um, you know, among them are things like ALMA, the Atacama Millimeter Large Millimeter Array. And that is a one of the highest resolution radio telescopes we have. And they also use a lot of infrared and, and uh, um, uh, other radio telescopes around the world to build these images. And they're in high demand and scheduling them in a way that makes this a viable 
campaign is extremely difficult. And it's un, it's unclear as to whether the telescopes on Mauna Kea or even the ones later after the fact will be able to do that. Hey, Christians, welcome. Welcome back. It's been a while. It's good to see you again. Um, it's good to it's good to have you back. Let me let me look at some of these things. A salt tube. I hear complaints from lots of yeah. This website is going downhill, but that yeah, we won't go back into that. Um, thanks only for keeping going and keeping. <laughs> I hope it's interesting, Phil. I'm trying to be interesting. I'm streaming now more than ever. Quick announcement: if you if you stayed with me this far after my earlier rant about YouTube and we're 15 minutes in, uh, let me just tell you I'm streaming every night now. I know I can't I can't believe I'm doing it. I'm streaming every weeknight. Let me say that I'm going to take the weekends off. But um, I'm working with Dustin Gibson at um, OPT, and he's streaming every night as well on his Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Gibson Picks. We're going to change the name of Gibson Picks soon to the Clear Skies Network. And I'm gonna my time slot is from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on weeknights and he's gonna so you need to think of it a lot like a tv station right like what's on cbs right now right or whatever it is and then you look and you, you tune in and every night the idea is that every night you tune in you're going to get some kind of astronomy content and i'll be there from eight to ten and my focus is going to be on the science of astronomy and the uh, physics and and i'll talk about astro or amateur astronomy too astrophotography and things like that but dustin's the stream you're going to want to watch if you care about gear right so he's the one that's right fo that follows me and he's the ceo of opt and he's they're available for questions and comments and stuff. So I would highly encourage you to check out and subscribe if you can afford it, or at least follow uh, the Twitch channel, and you'll be supporting Deep Astronomy that way too. Um, because in one, in the in the sense that when one way YouTube has let me down, um, I see a lot of promise on on Twitch. I see a lot of promise on Library.tv. That's L B R Y TV. Uh, in, and I see a lot of promise on that platform as well. So, you know, I'm taking this time to pivot and I'm going to, you know, YouTube is great. I've got, you know, there's, I'm, I supposedly have a large audience, <laughs> not so much. I mean, just look at the view count on my videos. I'm getting back off on this again. Stop it. Okay. That's not what we're here to talk about, but I did want to mention that there is a live stream. You can check out every, every night, eight to 10 eat Eastern time, uh, to, uh, uh, watch me, uh, every weeknight. So there's that. So there you go. Um, so let's see what Reverend Christine has to say. The shutdown of observatories. Is it to do something they fit the feds government don't want us to see or know about? I ask because of all the stuff online. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean there, Reverend, but the, uh, it, 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 I don't think it's ever about something they don't want us to see. I mean, let's look at some of the, the, the things that people are saying. Let me, let me just, let me just go. I, I've pulled up some web pages um, of different responses. So, for example, here's the Space Telescope Science Institute's response to COVID-19. They um, operate the Hubble Space Telescope, and they are going to be operating the James Webb Space Telescope. Have some news on that in a little bit later in the, in the stream. We'll talk about JWST. But here's what they say. It's the COVID-19 coronavirus is causing major disruption and distress for the worldwide community, including impacts to scientists and staff at many universities and research institutions. Our commitment to excelling in the science operations of astrophysics, flagship missions, advancing state-of-the-art archives, and tools for astronomical discovery and making astronomical information available remains as strong as ever. We are here to serve and support astronomical research and researchers, and we are doing this while taking due account of the health and safety of our staff. staff. Thus, we are not accepting visitors at this time. I mean, it's not like you could really go to, I mean, you could go there if you wanted to <laughs> and visit STSCI. There's not a whole bunch to see, though. It's just a, hey, thanks, Hans. Wow. Thank you, man. I do appreciate it. Uh, yes, this is where, if, if you're so inclined to support the YouTube efforts, this is where to do it. Hans, you're a rock star. You, you're with me a long time, and um, I appreciate all you're doing for. So thank you very, very much. It matters. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you go, to, you go to the Institute, and basically they have an office building on the Johns Hopkins campus, right, Johns Hopkins University. And it's just a building. And they're putting the James Webb uh, Space Telescope Control Center there on the fourth floor. So they basically had to squish all these offices out of the fourth floor to uh, make room for this control center for JWST. And yeah, there's like Chris, uh, Christian used to work there too. So um, 
He's Launchpad Astronomy, by the way. And yeah, it's there's nothing to see but just offices. So, but they're not accepting visitors right now. And I know that everybody's working from home. Here's the, here's a quick little personal story about the institute. I left there in 2016, and one of the big reasons I left there was because I um, they had it. They were starting to embrace remote working, teleworking, right? Because, like I said, they're in, they're an office building in Johns Hopkins University, and um, uh, they it's hard to get to downtown Baltimore every single day for work. And I really wanted to work from wherever my home was, which was at the time uh, up in, in Baltimore County. So I, <laughs> I, um, uh, I think it's, it was near, it was in, it was near Towson university too, actually Christian. So I might've been close to you and not have known it. Uh, but the, um, uh, they cut all that off when they, when, uh, when Ken Sembach became director and uh, cause Matt mountain used to be the director. And then a bunch, there were a bunch of retirements and the people who left were the ones that started all this work about teleworking and the ones that stayed didn't care. They wanted you in the office all the time. So and I quit in part because they wouldn't let me telework. And now of course they're all teleworking. So I'm a little bit bummed by that, but you know, that's just the way it goes, I suppose. Uh, all right, so that's what the Institute is doing. But here is what the European Southern Observatory is doing. Now, the Europe ESO runs, they're based in Germany in Munich, and they run telescopes on Paranal in Chile. Okay, they have the very large telescope. They have um, in the, an entire complex of things up there. Uh, and they said that um, they are... They transitioned the ESO observatory sites into a state, into what they're calling a safe state, and it was completed last week. This was today. They just uh, they just posted this today. Uh, it was completed last week, and science observations have now been paused. A minimal team remains on each site to ensure the safety of the facilities and the well-being of the remaining people. Uh, following the latest developments of the COVID-19, oh, that's just a prior update. So they're closed. Uh, nobody's at the observatories there either. And they are also, this, this one is more uh, germane, uh, they're also cutting out visits to the ESO sites. Now, those, those are places you actually want to go. <laughs> the Institute, not so much. But, um, but this, you actually would like to go see the ESO sites if you're ever in Chile, right? Well, you can't right now. Uh, ESO is actively monitoring the fast development of COVID-19 and to ensure the safety of its staff and the public, ESO has decided to take the precautionary measure to suspend public visits. Uh, to each of those until to both uh, La Silla and Paranal observatories until further notice. And so you can't go there if you want to. And here's where they are. Um, uh, they're located down in the, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Um, it's located down here in Chile. Um, uh, you generally have to fly into Santiago. That's what I do. And then uh, uh, I guess you go up here to, the, to oh, there's La Silla right there. And Paranal is right there. Uh, so yeah, you generally have, well, I guess you can take a flight to La Serena and get there. I've never done it that way before. I've gone to Santiago. That's the big, that's the big airport they have. But anyway, uh, you can't go. So don't, if you got plans to go to Paranal or Lycia, forget about it. Here's what NASA says. NASA, uh, is basically got a really big, uh, response page where if you, well, here's their actual statement. Uh, again, it's just like what everybody else is saying they're taking care of their people first priority is the safety and all of this kind of stuff but they have a lot of uh, mission critical stuff obviously they run things from uh the iss all the way to uh the perseverance or the, i'm sorry the uh the rover uh the rovers and stuff on mars and they do just all kinds of stuff but here's the thing i wanted to bring to your attention we talk about a, a jwst a lot on this um a, a lot on this channel and we all care a lot about this telescope project but it is uh the james webb space telescope team is suspending integration and testing operations decisions could be adjusted as the situation continues to unfold over the weekend and in the next week the decision was made to ensure the safety of the workforce the observatory remains safe in its clean room environment i don't know if you guys saw the uh the uh james webb jwst uh, mirror test they just did where they deployed it i'll show it to you if you haven't um but they stopped work on jwst now remember a couple months ago i think it was in january i did a hangout on jwst and what the government uh accounting office said about about um 
the JWST mission having about a 17% chance of not being delayed. Remember they said that? And <laughs> so, um, uh, I think that's now a hundred percent, uh, that it's going to be delayed. Uh, uh, it's a 0% chance that it won't be delayed. Uh, let's put it that way. Uh, and so here's what I would, here's what I want to do. I, I've been, I've been talking in other streams about this. I did this last night before last on, on Twitch. I said, um, okay, we, what we should do is figure out, I don't, if any of you know how to make up a betting pool that we can do online, let's do this because I think that what we should do is, is all take bets on when we think the James Webb Space Telescope is actually going to launch. This will delay it. It is not going to happen in March of 2021. That was just last month, and we're a year away. We're less than a year away of when it's supposed to be launched. It ain't going to happen. If you'll recall, I told you that Eric Schmidt, the uh, project scientist for the mission, said that the next big thing for JWST was going to be this uh, this integration testing that's happening in June, or he said the spring, but I think it was scheduled to happen in June. If all that was the big test of the entire observatory all at once. And after that test, they were going to give it a go, no go for launch. And then the next step was to get it down, to pack it all up and get it down to, to French Guyana where they were going to load it onto the Ariane 5 rocket. Well, I would lay odds, I'm huge odds that that's not going to happen in March. Uh, and the, even the, the integration testing is probably now not going to happen in spring. It'll probably happen, well, who knows now, because nobody knows anything about when they can get back to work. And not just NASA and the observatories, but everywhere else in the world, right? So um, when this will actually happen, who knows? It also, I think, means we won't get to the moon uh, using the with the Artemis program anywhere near 2024. It was already going to be a a huge pipe dream, I always thought, to get us there by 2024. Now, um, I don't know. We should, But we should set up a pool and take bets on when we think the James Webb Space Telescope will actually launch. If I had a bet, and I would bet on this, I would bet that it's not going to go until no earlier than March of 2022. That's a further year out is when I think it will actually launch. No earlier than that. And probably later. <laughs> so, so um, I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, okay. So here, Adam's saying Feb twenty twenty three. That's about what I think, right? So, um, uh, so yeah. Tell me what you guys think. Um, so that's uh, that's sad news. Um, I think, and also, I don't know about you guys, but I'm worried about Boeing. Boeing's a mess as a company right now. And they're in charge of the SLS, right? And the Orion capsule that's supposed to be taking us back to the moon. So all of these things combined, I think, puts a real damper on the moon. And, of course, another thing I saw, not this week, but I saw it in uh, early March, was ESA, the European Space Agency, has postponed any work on the ExoMars mission. Now, ESA's got a plan to send a rover to Mars. Uh, they've already got an orbiter there, and the, this rover was going to um, be launched. Oh, I forgot the launch date of that. Maybe Galaxy, if you're here, you know you can remember where that was. But yeah, it's. Uh, um, but the, so you know the ExoMars thing, and I don't know what effect this is going to have on. Does it say here what effect it's going to have on? The Perseverance rover. Let me look and see here. This is NASA's webpage again. Uh, NASA's Mars. Oh, here it is. NASA's Mars 2020 mission, which includes the Perseverance rover and Mars helicopter, remains a high priority for the agency, and launch and other mission preparations will continue. Much of the work is being done by employees and contractors who work remotely across the agency. So assessments by agency leadership are underway for anyone required to work in areas under restriction, such as NASA's JPL. Uh, especially after the recent announcement by the California by California's governor. Uh, let's, oh, here's some stuff on Artemis. Work on the agency's Artemis program will continue with limited production of hardware and software for NASA's Space Launch System rocket. SLS and Orion manufacturing and testing activities at NASA's Michaud Assembly Facility and Stennis Space Center are temporarily on hold. And the Artemis One Orion spacecraft will be shipped from the agency's Glenn Research Center to its Kennedy Space Center. Uh, where it will 
will eventually will be attached to the top of the SLS uh, for the Artemis One lunar mission. Um, it doesn't say anything about dates here. Uh, assembly and processing work is continuing on the Artemis II Orion spacecraft at Kennedy. Okay. Um, since the human landing system program leverages capabilities across the agency, it already functions as a virtual team to conduct engineering uh, analysis and other work. It has seen minimal impact from the requirement for mandatory, mandatory telework. So most development work on the Gateway program continues and can be done remotely. However, any on-site uh, activity beyond securing hardware is temporarily suspended until further notice. So it sounds like to the extent that you can work remotely, these programs and projects are continuing onward. Astronaut training continues, it says here. Um, as do preparations for the April 9th launch of NASA's uh, Chris Cassidy and two Russian cosmonauts. So that's still going forward. NASA and its international and commercial partners always take steps to prevent the crew from being bringing illness, illnesses like the cold or flu, to the ISS. Yeah, they, they've got a system already in place for sequestering people for quite a while. So <laughs> it, I would be, it would be a major fail if they launch somebody with uh, corona or COVID-19 up there. Um, so they are I'm sure, but that's going to happen, I guess, next week. So work also continues on the commercial crew program, a critical element to maintaining safe operations of the ISS and a sustained U.S. presence in the orbital orbiting laboratory. Uh, commercial resupply activities and future missions will still go. SpaceX is still down here launching like crazy. They just did one last week. So, uh, yeah, they're still down here uh, doing that. Um, but what they have is kind of cool. Where did, where did I see that? I thought I had it somewhere. Somewhere they have a web page. I must have closed it by accident. They had a web page that... This is the latest update they've had. Now, they had a grid where you could see all the different... Um, all the different sites around NASA and all the different missions and what and they had a color-coded grid for whether they were okay or not and I can't seem to find that right now oh here it is response framework um, oh no that's not it okay sorry I, I, I lost that web page but if you root around NASA's website you'll find oh here maybe it is a NASA people ah here we go this is what I was looking for uh, NASA facility status so you could see all of these different facilities like Kennedy, JPL, Johnson, Plumbrook, what their, what their status is and, um, and, uh, what they're doing about, you know, what, what they're doing about the uh, various missions. So anyway, so there's NASA. I already talked about ESA, but let's just do a quick look up ESA, uh, coronavirus. Let's see what they say. Uh, Let's see, information about all visitors to ESA sites. Um, let's see, ESA brings space room up. Uh, now they just have, it looks like, standard things they're doing about what they're doing with the virus and stuff. It doesn't say a lot about the missions and whatnot. So, but let me show, let's, let's look at JWS. Let me show you that mission, uh, that mirror deployment, JWST mirror test. Oh, let's see. Yeah. There we are. Full mirror deployment. This happened a couple days ago. Uh, day before yesterday, they announced this. Uh, it's really kind of neat. So let's just take a quick look here. So this is the primary mirror segment of JWST. This is set up right now at the God or at the uh, Redondo Beach facility at North of Drummond. Now they've got it. Um, They've got it set up so that it's hanging uh, from the rafters of this clean room as if it were in space. They've taken all the weight off of the mirrors because obviously the hinges are designed to be worked. See right there, this offloads the weight of the mirrors. Uh, they're obviously designed to work in weightlessness. And so they, uh, they compensate for that with those things on top. It's crazy. I mean, here we go. They're fully deploying the mirror. This is a big deal, right? I mean, you don't just do this. <laughs> but look at that, man. I mean, that is gorgeous. That is amazing. Like gold-coated mirrors and um, 
Let me do it one more time. Uh, sitting on beryllium uh, substructure behind it and a very lightweight. And, uh, you know, this thing is six and a half meters in diameter, way bigger than Hubble. So, I mean, say what you will about JWST. It's a freaking beautiful instrument. I mean, it's not going to launch anytime soon, but we can dream about it, can't we? I mean, I, still, I love looking at this. Anyway, that was one of the latest tests that just successfully depleted or completed. But I don't think any of us are really worried about this primary, are we? We're more worried about that thing down below. See those long foil-like uh, bunches of material? That's the stuff we do. That's the heat of the sunshine. So that's what we do. There's five of those. And that's Um, that not being the most amazing thing we've ever launched once it finally does get up there. So anyway, um, that's the latest on JWST. The latest of what I know on the, um, oh, and I should mention that some of the, um, some of the other people I used to work with, like uh, the High Altitude Observatory in Boulder, uh, they operate the Mauna Loa Solar Observatory. They're on Mauna Loa, which is an active volcano. Mauna Kea is right across the Saddle Road, but on Mauna Mauna Loa is on the other side, and that's where the actual volcano is. Uh, they always keep a presence up there uh, to operate uh, things. But he, um, they, well, there's, last I last when I worked there, there was only two observers, three observers that rotated uh, in in shifts, and they were only one up there at a time. So um, there, you know, the operations of Mauna Loa Solar Observatory uh, should still be okay. On, but like I said, the governor's clamp down on travel uh keeps them at home so all right um it looks like they're dressed for covid already yeah well that's a clean room dan so you know you don't they don't want anything any contamination in that room uh like dust or you know just goop that come the human body is a pretty disgusting thing if you think about it lots of skin cells flying everywhere and stuff so you want to keep all that stuff uh there um, so Charlie says the observatory I work with is shut down. No one in the offices and the telescopes are all shut down. I suspect there's a small number of people up on the mountain to keep things together. Yeah, that seems to be Charlie. What, uh, what, how most observatories are doing it. They've got a skeleton staff up there observing social distancing and stuff, uh, to keep the observatories, uh, you know, from just being unattended. But um, think about it. Almost all of them are in a remote location, right? So they're already in a pretty uh, good place to keep away from people in. So if you just keep a skeleton crew there, um, that'll that'll be all you need. Where do you work, Charlie? What's your uh, what's your observatory? If you don't mind saying. Um, <laughs> will JWST launch before 2050? You know, Michael, I it's on it, it's your your guess is as good as mine. I hope so, but you know, I mean, who knows? W first is making more progress than uh, JWST is at this point. Of course, that's not really a fair comparison, but uh, yeah, I mean, W first is going to probably launch before JWST does. Um, oh, cool, Charlie. That's really nice. Um, OCIW? I don't know where that is. OCIW. Is that an observatory? Uh, oh, is, that a, is it from... Is, uh, I typed in OCIW and got to Carnegie, Ob Carnegie Observatories. Oh, you guys, uh, you guys operate Las Campanas in Chile, and you're also part of the GMT. Oh, okay. All right. That's, that's really cool. Well, so let's look at this since we're on the topic of it. So here is the Carnegie Observatory, Carnegie Science webpage. Um, their upcoming events, this was postponed this Friday. They had some, uh, apparently a talk or something uh, postponed, so that's... So yeah, they're all closed down too. 
Ah, uh, you're in Pasadena. Okay, thanks, man. Um, okay, so that's that's what that stands for. I typed in OCIW and got this, so I figured. Yeah, so you guys are part of the uh, 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 GM, the GMT as well. It sounds like. Um, it says there, the groundbreaking work continues today at our world's famous Las Campanas Observatory in Chile, which is home to the twin Magellan telescopes and the site of the future GM, giant Magellan telescope. Uh, Carnegie scientists are still in the vanguard of research on galaxy formation, evolution, and chemical evolution of stars, planets, stellar variability, supernovae, and more. Cool, man. Thanks, Charlie, for, for sharing that. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, what you guys are doing seems to be very uh, similar to what... Um, Everyone else is doing, right? You're just shutting down and hunkering down and keeping a skeleton. Oh, look at that. That's really cool. That, that's up at Las Campanas, I guess. That's, that's really cool. These places are beautiful, man. I mean, I, I don't know what this is going to mean for travel after all this is over, but these are places in the world that are definitely worth visiting. Um, I, used to, I went to uh, CTIO, which is at Cerro Tololo Inter agency observatory or something like that international Universe observatory and they they operate a four meter telescope with it where we put the the d cam the dark energy camera and it um it was a i spent about a week up there and i just i loved it it was absolutely breathtaking the scar the stars and the skies up there i mean there's a reason why they build these observatories up there folks i mean they are unlike anything you've ever seen before. The large and small Magellanic clouds, I had never seen them before, not outside of images. It was just crazy, just absolutely crazy. I helped build the ARC 3.5 meter and SDSS 2.5. Oh, so you worked on Sloan as well. Um, I was involved in the construction of the Magellan telescopes in the early... Dude, uh, Charlie, I should like give you a Zoom meeting link and you should get on here and talk to me about what you're doing, man. That's what we ought to do. Uh... You ought to come on here and just tell me, hey, Aiken, it's good to see you again. Um, which is more interesting, the southern or the northern night sky? That's a good question, man. Um, Michael, let's see. What would I... I guess I'm going to go with the northern hemisphere just because I'm more familiar with it. But I do know that there are things in the southern hemisphere, like the large and small Magellanic clouds, that you can only see from down there. And there's also... Um, uh, what is it? Is it, um, there's, uh, I think Centaurus, the constellation Centaurus has some cool stuff in it. That's also from the South. Uh, so, um, so I guess I'm going to say Northern hemisphere. Um, Apophis, is it going to hit? Hey, I did a video on this. Just Steven, Stefan, Steven, uh, whichever, however you, however you pronounce your name. A couple videos back, uh, I uploaded Apophis. Is it going to hit? Um, and the answer is no. It is not going to hit in 2029. It is not going to hit again in 2036 when it comes back around again. And then there's some speculation about 2064 or something like that when it comes around a third time. Um, but I don't. Uh, I don't think the none of the astronomers I've ever talked to about it um, have have ever expressed any uh, concern over the issue. So no, as far as the 2026 flybys, uh, 2029 flyby, I mean, uh, is going to be. Uh, what they are, though, is quite excited about this, right? The Ap Apophis is coming, and it is going to fly really, really close to the Earth. It's going to get so close that 2 billion people on Earth are going to be able to see it with their naked eye just by looking up. So if you've been watching this channel and following my advice on keep looking up, then you will discover Apophis flying overhead underneath the orbit of geosynchronous satellites. That's how close it's going to get. Where will it be most visible? You have to watch my video. But anywhere from, it'll, it'll start approaching, uh, I think, over Africa. You'll be able to start to see it as it goes over Africa and then across the uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean. And most of the United States will be able to see it. And Europe will be able to see it, albeit low in the sky. So uh, it's going to be exciting. And astronomers want to use this as a um, laboratory for what to do on potentially hazardous asteroids, PHAs. So they want to actually send stuff out there. Um, um, 
who was it? Uh, MIT wants to send up something called Project Apophis. They have a, a thing they want to launch out there uh, and, and actually fly over there to it and grab some stuff. Um, people want to push it around. People want to, at the very least, they want to fly around it and follow it as it comes by the Earth and, and see things like, you know, it's get its mass and its, um, not well, they already know its mass, but, you know, its uh, uh, characteristics up close and things like that because it's going to be a great opportunity to study the behavior of what happens when they uh, fly by close to Earth. So, uh, so let's see. Neil, uh, how do we defend Earth from rubble pile asteroids? Uh, just like downtown. Well, you've been around, you've been around, Michael. <laughs> I never, I haven't said that in a long time. Uh, but it is just like downtown. It is, it is, man. Uh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Well, I mean, rubble, uh, rubble pile, you mean just like a bunch of rocks that are kind of glommed together? Um, well, over a certain size, the atmosphere will protect us. But I, th I think what you mean is, you know, what do we, what do, we do with something like the Chebelyansk-sized rockets, these, or these bolides that come out and explode in the atmosphere? And, you know, they're working on it. I mean, you know, the NASA has some things they want to try. Uh, they're going out to touch Bennu in part because they want to, learn about what to do with these asteroids i think there's a couple of i don't have the names off the top of my head but there's some some missions out there that want to try and deflect an asteroid a little bit these ion engines that you've been hearing about these super powerful electric um electric motors that they're sending in space they want to use those to push uh and affect uh asteroids the thing is um uh, the further away you can detect these things the better off the better chance you have of making a difference in their trajectories towards Earth. So a little bit of, of energy applied far away makes a big difference by the time it gets here to Earth. So that's where they're focusing. I've even heard that you could apply paint, on white paint, on one side of an asteroid surface so that the radiation pressure of the sun reflecting off that paint uh, would actually be enough to push things i mean it could probably happen i mean if we can have light sails up there running uh, you know the um in orbit you know on radiation pressure why not i mean i don't know if it's enough to make any difference but some people think so so that's a serious uh that's a serious line of work uh, let's see i thought i heard if it went through a certain loop or certain space that it could hit or it could throw into a different trajectory. Yes, Stephen, that's true. It's called the keyhole, the thing you're talking about, that little area that it could fly through. And I suppose that's still true, that they it could fly through a keyhole that if that is very, very small, right? And if it did fly through it, then it would be such that the, the subsequent flyby in 2036 would be altered enough that it would hit the Earth. But the chances of that happening, I think, are close to zero. And it used to be a much larger chance that that was going to happen. But they've since narrowed this down. They've been looking at Apophis pretty pretty heavy now. Um, and so um, one resource I'll tell you guys about is a guy called Asteroid Hunters. He has a YouTube channel here. And his he and his son have set up in their home observatory a C-14 operating at F-2 or F-1.2 eight or something like that, where they look at large areas of the sky and they map these asteroids, right? Not just, not just the ones that are out there in deep space, but NEOs and PHAs. And so he would be a good resource to talk to about Apophis and whether, it's a, a, whether it is a danger or not. He's again, it's asteroid hunters. He's got a YouTube channel. He streams almost every night on Twitch and it's asteroid underscore hunters. So if you're interested in this topic, I would definitely go with him because he is not only interested in the topic, but he's actually providing data to uh, official Atlas databases uh, to refine these orbits. And he can tell you a lot more about the Apophis keyhole than I could and uh, the chances of that happening. What I've always been concerned about and what I would like to talk to Mike more about, he's the Asteroid Hunters guy, it's his name, Mike, uh, is what about these ones we always see on the news feed? Like the new asteroid nobody ever saw is coming really close to Earth. You know, I mean, you know, does he then fire up his scope and then make sure it's not going to hit Earth or what does he do, right? I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, I, wanted to, I should have asked him that last night. He was on my stream. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, I wonder about that kind of thing. To me... This is important work, right? It's probably among the most important things that NASA does, for sure, with NEOWISE. But this Near-Earth Object Program, 
that NASA has and that other observatories around the world have, I think is a really important, one of the most important things we can do. Because we know where a lot of the asteroids are in our solar system, but there's also a lot we don't know are out there. But we know they're there, right? And we know they're there because of the gravitational effects they have on the, the uh, solar system bodies that we can see. So it's those we need to worry about, and we need to look for those and get them charted and mapped accurately, get the astrometry on those so that we know if they're going to really hit Earth or not. So if you're interested in becoming, you know, using your amateur equipment to do this, I would highly recommend it. Uh, and you definitely want to look at Asteroid Hunters as a resource for that because he's, he's a good job. Uh, he does a good job. Um, so let's see. I think all countries that have nuclear missiles should modify them to intercept. Oops, you scrolled up. Uh, this this asteroid, this asteroid's far from Earth and explode full yield at the same time, and that would push it and other rubble away. Well, salt tube, you'd think that'd be a good idea, right? I mean, I can see how you think that's a good idea, but do you really, really think that we're gonna get? If all of the countries that had nuclear weapons launching them, <laughs> do you really think that's going to go without a hitch? So I think we should just leave them alone. <laughs> Don't touch the nuclear warheads, okay? Leave them be. That's one problem. The other problem is you might make the problem situation worse, right? Let's say you hit one of these big suckers that are out there hitting on Earth. You blow it up. Now you've got hundreds or thousands of little tiny ones. <laughs> headed right at you, right? So have you made the situation better or worse, right? So you got to think about this stuff. But I think anything involving nuclear weapons and the countries that have them, based on the current world leadership that we're all getting used to looking at and scratching our heads about, uh, it's probably not a good idea. Just leave the nuclear in uh, warheads alone. Don't touch them. Leave them alone. <laughs> Nobody, no touchy. <laughs> just don't. <laughs> I just don't see that going well. Okay, so <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, hey, John, it's good to see you. Hi, John. Uh, so you're cooking bacon. Oh, well, bacon rashers. I mean, the UK has bacon down, so good for you, man. I would love a bacon sandwich. Uh, uh, Galaxia, I hope they will send out instruments that can measure organic molecules. Furthermore, while you are there, grab a piece, bring it back to the ground, and find components of life, broken life, and so to speak, and all that kind of stuff. Yes, and I think they want to do that with Apophis when it flies close by. Certainly, I think they're doing something like that with Bennu, um, but I think they're just trying to get a piece of it and bring it home. Um, and, and, and get that whole thing down. Uh, so let's see. Uncle Bill says half right, Stephen, every uh, near approach, uh, alters the orbit a bit, uh, for potential trouble in the future orbits. Uh, and it's a matter of extreme precision. We can't nail down over multiple approaches. Yeah. I mean, there's still a chance and that's what a lot of people are worried about. I think it's 2060. What is it? 2060 something four or eight. I forget what it is. And anyway, they're thinking that that flyby could be trouble, but won't be for me. I'll be long gone. But for those of you who are left behind. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Gregorius, you're right. Asteroid Hunters only streams during clear skies. But, but hey, you know, I mean, if you're doing it, um, you know, and you catch him, it's a good, it's a good way to, uh, it's a good way to, uh, you know, learn about this stuff. He's a good resource. Um, Apophis should be renamed. Uh, to Greek, uh, great opportunity in Greek or Latin. Um, I kind of like its name. What is it? it it's uh, it's uh, Egyptian, isn't it? Apophis was a god of was it chaos or something like that. I kind of like that name. Um, uh, let's see. Years past, I read accounts of a huge meteor stream. This is from Susan. Uh, uh, flyby, somewhat like a chain hitting Jupiter. Yeah, you're talking about comet Hale Bop. Uh, Atlantic sailing ships and East Coast cities wrote accounts. I would love to read a book or article. You're talking about Comet Hale Bop. And I'll tell you, let's just pull up a quick thing on it. If you, Hubble did some good observations. Let's see, Comet Hale Bop. You're watching Tony through the internet. Con a Hubble image of Comet Hale Bop. Wow, look at this. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> this is an old website. This is like nineteen, you know, nineties. Well, it is October ninety five. So there's there's Harold there's Hale Bop, 
that's not what I wanted to show you. I'm sure you've seen it. It's the uh, uh, hits Jupiter. <laughs> I love that 1995 website. Uh, here's space. Oh, I don't want to go to space.com. They, oh, good. I'm not being bombarded with ads. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So you can see the stream of comets hitting Jupiter. Um, so this is uh, this is from Hubble. Yeah, it was a pretty spectacular thing. And you could see this with your own telescopes at the time, too. I mean, people, I mean, uh, I had an LX200, a, a 10 inch at the time, uh, but it was cloudy where I was. I couldn't see it. But I did, I did like the Hubble, the Hubble images of it. That's pretty cool. So, yeah, that's what you're talking about, Susan. Um, let's see. I hope it won't hit. This is from Hans, or it will be overrun by huge insects. Huh? Where'd you go? Oh, I saw a documentary once about that called <laughs> Starship Troopers. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, yeah, okay, you had me there. <laughs> uh, let's see. Send in Clint Eastwood and a few other has beens. They'll sort out. Yeah, I remember that movie. <laughs> I remember that movie. What was it called? Space Cowboys had all these old guys on it, and Clint Eastwood was one of them. And I forget who else it was. Um, it was a terrible movie, I thought. Um, <laughs> yeah, salt of your yeah. So uh, let's not let's not play with the nuclear weapons. It's definitely, um, yeah, it's chaos. Okay, um, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, yeah, that was cutting edge website design, wasn't it? Yeah, man, that was definitely some web 1.0 stuff there. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. I mean, how many of you guys have ever had a website like this? I don't know if you ever did green background. I, w I wish they had little animated GIFs twirling around in there, like a Homer Simpson web page. But yeah, there's still these web pages around. Can you believe it? This is JPL we're talking about, too. You know, this isn't just anybody. This is JPL, has, you know, clearly they. Uh, They uh, haven't bothered to re redo the design on this. Astronomy picture of the day is also, surprisingly enough, very 1995 looking. Have you noticed? If you go to APOD, uh, they haven't done much with this since it's been around since forever. But it's still very much, uh, at least they've got a white background. But look at this design. I mean, this is pretty much... Um, 1995 stuff here too, web 1.0. 1, 1 but I guess, you know, it does what it does. If you don't know about APOD, you need to find out. It's one of those things that you need to check every day. Uh, this particular uh, image is all about Venus passing through the Pleiades this week. And uh, right now, today, Venus is just shy of the Pleiades. Tomorrow it will be right in the Pleiades and then it'll pass on by. It's really amazing how high up Venus is right now in the horizon. Have you guys noticed? It's like way up. It's like 20, 20 or so, 25 degrees above the horizon. Um, good old days of dial up. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's, an advantage, there's an advantage to that, right? I mean, you want to have, uh, you know, um, fast loading websites. At least they're not tracking you and stuff like that that's vomit green <laughs> all right now let's not let's not get on back then it was fun to make html geocities i remember them <laughs> early netscape uh, uh at first it was named apophis which is god of destruction thank you i appreciate that george uh sounds nice but now it's inaccurate now i know but i still kind of like it i thought it was chaos but uh, destruction's even better. <laughs> yeah, we've all had those, haven't we, George? I mean, come on. They, they load fast. You could, you could write them in just a few HTML lines, and now nobody knows HTML, do they? They all, how do people build web pages now? I guess they do it with, uh, JavaScript and, um, and, uh, you know, just some kind of active page design. I don't, I haven't designed, I, I don't, do web design anymore. I, most of them are co oh, content management systems. That's what people use like WordPress and stuff. Um, 
So any news on the C-2019 Y4 Comet visible at the moment near the North Star? It was brightening more than expected. Uh, let's see if I can do this impromptu, Hans. Uh, where is Delirium? There it is. Let me see if I can pull this up. Let me get that out of there. All right, so there's Delirium. Got too many things going at once here. My computer is very slow. All right, let me see if I can do this. So, Stellarium. All right. Here we go. I have Stellarium up. Let me make this a little embiggened. And let's go. Sun's up right now. Let's let the sun set. All right. So now the sun is down. So this is tonight looking at the west. So you want to go north. North. And let me hit, what is it, F3 is the search? Yeah. Uh, let's see. What is it? Uh, C Y. Oh, what is it? C Y. No, that's not it. Um, I forgot the little nomenclature for it. What was it? Uh, let me just see. I think I type in Atlas. Uh, there it is. C C nineteen Y four. Twenty nineteen Y four. There it is, the con. All right, so let's go there. Okay, so there it is. Let me draw the constellation lines and the and the uh, names. So here is Ursa. Can you see my? Yeah, you can. Good. I mean, there's my cursor. Has got there's the North Star. That's Polaris. And so the comet is right here. The best. I, I don't know. The way I would probably find it is by um, the Big Dipper. Is here I might try and draw some stars from those two pan or from the pan stars to here and try and find it. You can see this with a um, pair of binoculars right now, and uh, yeah, so you definitely it is it is a bit brighter. I've heard. Um, <laughs> Peter, yeah, well, you say hello world is you're supposed to have print hello world. <laughs> yep. You have the Sinclair still. That's cool. So anyway, there is where uh, the comet is. And I'm trying to... Let me get rid of my little deep astronomy thing there so you don't need, you don't need to see that. Um, so yeah, you can see there's all the info on the uh, comet here. Um, it's currently, according to this, absolute magnitude 6. Uh, it's currently reduced, uh, it was 7.7, 7, uh, reduced by, reduced to uh, 7.8 by 1.3 air masses, and air masses, uh, how thick the atmosphere is. Um, so let's see, what am I at? This is about 9 o'clock tonight in the East Coast. Uh, this is just where I live here in Florida. So, uh, it's way up in the sky, so um, because it's in the north northern hemisphere, the northern section of the sky, you don't have to worry about rising and setting uh, so much of the of the daily motion until it gets. I mean, this will eventually come down into the west, but at nine o'clock, it's high in the sky, so it's really good to go out right after it's dark. Let me back this up a little bit. Oh, wrong way. Uh, let me back it up a little bit. So it gets dark around here. Oh, uh, about eight o'clock, eight thirty. So I, if you went out about eight fifteen, eight twenty Eastern time, right after sunset, uh, you should be able to see it. So that's where it'll be, right up there. Okay.
All right, guys. Well, I am going to head out. I want to thank you all for watching. And uh, if you are, if you want more live streaming action, <laughs> go to uh, twitch.tv slash Gibson Picks for now. I'll be streaming from 8 to 10 there. Uh, I take my cues heavily from you guys, a lot like what we did here today, even though I had some content planned out. It was uh, driven in large part by you guys, so thank you. I want to thank Susan Hunter and, and Hans Milling. Thank you for your support uh, in the in the um, Super Chat. I do appreciate that, and it does help. Uh, every little bit helps with uh, Deep Astronomy. Deep Astronomy is just, I'm just doing it because right now, I'm certainly not doing it because it makes any money. Um yeah, Hans. I mean, it is. It's very low. Uh, what do we, you know? So it's just above the treetops and some of my trees, depending on where I go. But yeah. Um, all right, you guys. Well, thanks for watching. I'll be back next Thursday uh, for another Astro Coffee Hangout. Um, uh, some of you guys need to like George. I think you need to like be a guest. Um, and tell and let's talk about what you're doing. Uh, so you know, if you want to join, just just give me a shout out somehow and just send me a. Uh, uh, when you say chat, you know, in the, ch in the super chat, I'll send you a link right away. It doesn't, doesn't take me much time to start a zoom meeting and I can get you right in. So, all right. On behalf of myself, <laughs> I'm used to saying on behalf of Dustin Gibson. Uh, I also do a podcast called space junk podcast. Please check that out. Um, you can get that anywhere. There are podcasts. And so thank you all so much for watching and I hope you guys stay safe. I hope you guys are, you know, getting through this. Okay. Um, I, my thoughts are with all of you and, um, thank you for watching and as always keep looking up.